Hey, so uh, everybody, I'm going to have you do a little bit of a, an exercise. You don't have to get up for this. So, um, but, but if you would, take your hand and just hold it like this, like you're holding your phone. Okay? All right, good. Now, kind of cock your head down a little bit like you're looking at your phone. Good. And then take your other finger and just go like this. Does this feel familiar? Some of y'all? Do you know, do you know we, we spend, as Americans... We spend two and a half hours a day on average doing this. Two, two and a half hours a day. That, that's 897 hours a year. Think about how many work weeks that is. Scrolling. On our phone, and and what's happened is is that it has caused a phenomenon that that I I honestly my girls told me about this some time ago, and I was like FOMO, what what is that? And uh, and, and and I actually like they started to tell me you know it's the fear of missing out, and I'm like missing out on what? Missing out on on what? is going on in the world, what's going on in other people's lives, what's going on in, 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 in on these posts and other things that I, I, I don't want to miss out. And, and I'm thinking, okay, I'm not sure I fully understand that. Um, and, but yet, at times, I realize that there's times where I see people post like something like, like we were, we were up in Chicago when this happened, but a jet flew over Sterling and Rock Falls, and there was like a million posts about, did you guys hear about the jet that flew over Sterling and Rock Falls? What happened? Was there a war? Is war breaking out? I mean, like, it was crazy. People were afraid because a jet flew over Sterling and Rock Falls. We have this thing, and it literally is a, 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 a clinical thing that, again, I was like, what? I'm looking it up. Cleveland Clinic of Medicine, science, behavioral science, has, has classified FOMO as an actual thing that people struggle with. The fear of missing out. And we have this fear that we're going to miss out on life, that we're going to miss out on, on and, or we see pictures of people doing things, and, we're, and, and, and it wells up inside of people like, a, why didn't they invite me? Like, like I, what, 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 did, I, was I, did I do something wrong? Did I say something wrong? Did I, did I, did I, why did I miss out on that party? And we have this thing of missing out. And, and, in some ways, obviously, two and a half hours a day scrolling on your phone, and that's on average, by the way, so that means there's people that do a lot more than that, and there's people that do a lot less than that, and you all probably know some of them, and you may be even thinking you're one of them, um, but we have this fear of missing out, and in some ways, that's not good, that's not healthy, but in some ways, I think about that in relationship to who God is, and, and I think there is some health in that as well. There is obviously unhealthy fear, but there's also healthy fear in that, you know, like if, if I see like a big honking spider, um, I'm not going to go up and pet it. Like I'm afraid of that thing, which is sometimes can be good, sometimes can be bad because it's like really I'm a I'm 200-pound dude. I could use my foot and squish it. Um, why am I scared of a spider? Um, unless you're in Honduras and you see spiders like that are this big um, and can jump and kill you, uh, then then it's like, then that doesn't mean don't 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 be afraid of going to Honduras because they have jumping scary spiders. Please, it's not that point. But again, some fear is good, some is not. I, this 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 series, what we want to do is is talk about it in a way that yes. Fear of missing out, well, not good in our lives, especially in relationship to scrolling on social media every single day. There is some health in going, you know what, I don't want to miss out on what God has for me. I don't want to miss out on God's will for my life. And, and here's, what, here's what I'm wondering is, is what could happen if we decided to give God back, let's just think about it, two and a half hours. What if we decided to say, God, I want to give you, two. again, am I saying scrolling on a phone is, is wrong? No, I'm not saying that. Two and a half hours, that, that may be a little bit extreme. What if we took that two hours of that two and a half, because I'll give you 
you know, I need 30 minutes of scrolling. Okay. Um, God's not going to be like, you shall not scroll on your phone. It doesn't say any of that anywhere in Scripture. But what if we gave God two hours back? And we said, you know what, I'm going to dedicate two hours to him. I'm going to dedicate two hours to being in relationship. I'm going to dedicate two hours to, to telling others the good news of Jesus. I'm going to dedicate two hours of spending it in his word on my knees in prayer. I'm going to, I'm going to dedicate back to him two hours what could, what could happen in our lives if we would do that? What, what could happen in our family if we, if we did that? What, what could happen in our church? What could happen in our community? What could happen in our world if we decided, you know what, I'm going to dedicate more time to God than I am to my phone? What could happen? I, I believe that, that what could happen is, is that we could see God do incredible things in and through our lives, things that, that Ephesians talks about that are beyond what we can begin to even think or imagine. I, I believe that, that God could do some incredible stuff in our families' lives and in our communities' lives and in our church life if we would just say collectively as, as individuals, we're going to give back to God. God, we're, we're wanting to just spend more time with you. God, we want to be in better relationship with you. We want to draw near to you, and, and God, we want to be about doing your will. And so what we want to talk about over the next several weeks is in answering this question, what is God's will for my life? What is God's will for my life? Have you ever asked that question? Many of you, I'm sure, have. I know that I have many times, even when Daisha and I were dating, and we were starting to think about getting married, and we were asking people, hey, what, what, when's, when should we get married? What's God's will for us in marriage? And, and a lot of people gave us a lot of answers. Um, some people were like, well, you need to make sure you've got your finances all in, all in order. Seriously? That's a terrible response. I'm sorry. I don't know. I, does anybody still have their finances in order that's married? I'm just wondering. Um, you, you need to make sure you have a full-time job. Okay, that's good advice, but I'm not sure that's the reason why I should get married to my wife is, is that we have full-time jobs, and so we're okay now. Um, there's a lot of different answers a lot of different ideas, a lot of different thoughts and suggestions out there. But what is the will of God for my life? Here, here's, what I, here's the big, big statement that I, that I want you to grab hold of. If you don't grab hold of anything else today, it's this. You can know and do God's will. You can know and do God's will. It's not a mystery. It's not some out there concept that, that I, you know, I have to be so intelligent to be able to, to comprehend. No, you can know and do God's will. So as you think about that, I want you to turn, if you would, open to uh, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Again, you can know and do God's will. Turn, turn to somebody and tell them that. You can know and do God's will. You need to not only hear it, but you need to audibly tell somebody. Tell them. You can know and do God's will. Tell them that. Now, whether or not you believe that or not is, is between you and God. I can't make you believe that, but, but here's the deal. You can know and do God's will. How do, how do I know that? Because Romans chapter 12 makes it really clear. Paul is writing... Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, sisters, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Notice that last statement. By Testing, you may discern, you may know what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. 
you can know and do God's will. You can know what his will is for your life. It is not a mystery. It is, it is not some code that you have to decipher. God wants you to know his will. God wants you to know his good and acceptable and perfect will. And the beauty is, is that he gives you everything you need in order to live it out in your life. He gives you everything you need. The Bible makes it clear, everything that we need for life and for godliness, God gives us so that we can carry out his will in our life. You can know and do God's will. I, I love how the message puts this, and, and so I'm, this is going to be up on the screen um, because it's different from, from what you just read because the message is, is, is not a version of the Bible, by the way. It, it is a transliteration or it is a, like a written in a novel form. It's a, a, maybe a good way to read for devotional use, but I wouldn't read it for the studying of the Word of God. But, but I love how, how they write it here. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. That's a, that's a huge thing, isn't it? Like, like, if you're going to do something in the name of God, it's really important to be dependent on God to help you through it. Here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, you're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work, or just walking around, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. What a cool statement. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. <laughs> wow. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of Im immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. You can know and do God's will. Again, looking at verse 2, the very last part, you can discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So what is the will of God? In a nutshell, here's the simple answer. We're going to be dissecting this over the next several weeks, but here's the simple answer. It is his desires for you. His desires for you and honestly for all humanity. It's God's desires for you and for all humanity that brings him pleasure and ultimately you as well. I believe God's will is universal. I believe God's will is absolute. And I believe God's will is knowable. Notice the three words in verse 2. And, and by the way, what I'm going to do today is work from verse 2 up to verse 1. So from the end of verse 2, I'm going to work backwards through this passage to help us better understand it. So here we go. What is God's will? God's will is what he desires for you, what he longs for you to have in your life, for you to experience in your life, for you to, to do in your life. And what is it about God's will that, that's so amazing? Well, notice what Paul says. It is good, it is acceptable, and it is perfect. Number one, God's will for the believer is good. It is good because God is is fully good, with no evil and no darkness in him at all. Every good and perfect gift, James tells us, comes from God. Every good and perfect gift comes from God, and he, check this out, Psalm 84 says this, he withholds no good thing for those who walk according to his will, or according to an uprightness of soul. God's good will is revealed for our benefit and for the benefit of those around us. 
God's will for you is good. God's will for every believer is acceptable. It's acceptable. God's will is acceptable or pleasing. You ever had something that, that you ate or something that you drank or something that you smelled that was just really, really pleasing to you? Yes? Yeah? I like food. Um, and, uh, yeah, I've been losing weight, but I, it's not a, uh, a I, get to, I have to limit everything I eat diet. Yesterday I had a hot dog, one of these massive hot dogs that were out here uh, for our autumn adventure, and that thing was a monster. And, uh, and I ate that thing down like it was, it was just like candy, um, and it felt so good. And then I opened up a Reese's peanut butter cup and had that too. Praise the Lord. That felt so good going down. Um, man, you know what I'm talking about? It was satisfying. God's will for your life is acceptable. It's satisfying. It will satisfy you. It will please you in every single way. Those who obey the will of God are acceptable to him. The believer who serves the Lord in spirit of humility and love and righteousness, the Bible says, is acceptable to God and approved by God. Men, God's will for every believer is acceptable. God's will for every believer is perfect. It's perfect. His perfect will has no defect. God's perfect will fully reaches the goal, the purpose, and the mission, exactly what it's intended to do. It will reach that in your life. How? By following God's perfect plan, he lets us reflect his perfect nature. What an awesome God that, that you and I, we're called his ambassadors. Second Corinthians tells us that. We're called his ambassadors. We get to represent God to a world around us that desperately needs to see him. God's will is perfect. Scripture has given us this and tells us again that, that it makes us perfect. His, his scripture thoroughly equips us for every good work. And so, again, God's will is good, it's acceptable, and perfect. The thing is, the thing is, and the struggle that we have is that God has not made us robots, God has not made us puppets, God has made us with an ability to choose, a free will. Every single one of us has it. You guys know this because if you've been around kids, you understand very quickly that they have a free will. Yesterday, again, out at, uh, at, at Autumn Adventure, it was on full display as kids were going all over the place. And some of them were obeying parents, and some of them were not. And I know for a fact as a kid, I did not oftentimes. And I regretted it oftentimes. I remember with our kids, we would sit down with them, and we would talk about with them, hey, whose side do you want to be on? Because your attitude right now doesn't reflect God's side. And you've got a choice to make. Do, am I going to be on God's side or am I going to be on Satan's side? Because that, really that's, that's the two options. And, and we would ask our kids, whose side do you want to be on? And most of the time, I don't think, I, I don't think our kids ever said Satan's side. <laughs> no. Ah, uh, thank God. Um, that would be scary, right? Satan's side. Oh, boy. Uh, we got a lot of work to do. Um, but, no, they, they would always they would say God's side. And then we would teach them, hey, here's what God's side looked like. And what you're doing right now, it's not reflecting that. But God gives us the ability to choose. And so as we look more into this verse, go back, beginning of verse 2. Notice what he says, if you want to know what his will is, his good, acceptable, and perfect will, don't, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Do not be conformed. In other words, do not blend in with the world around you. 
you, you as a follower of Jesus, you as someone who wants to do the will of God, you can't go with the world and go with God. You can't look like the world, you can't act like the world, you can't react like the world and go with God. That's what Paul is saying. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, to the thinking of this world, to the actions of this world, to the reactions of this world. You can't go that direction and know the will of God. If you're going the pattern of the world, the way of the world, my friend, you will miss out on the will of God in your life. And Paul is saying, do not conform to the pattern of this world. But what? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That word transform is actually the word metamorphosis, where we get, the, the, again, the, the idea, the word picture of a nasty, ugly caterpillar that gets into a cocoon, and then through a process of trial and pressure and all kinds of other things, is completely transformed into something new, a beautiful butterfly, sometimes a moth. Some of the moths are pretty ugly, I'm not going to lie. But there's something new about it. And the beauty of renewing our mind is, is that it is a process that God takes us through. The idea here is you choose which side you're going to be on, God's side or on Satan's side. Satan's side is the world's side. Listen, everything in our world is absolutely at odds with God. Why? Because Satan is in control of it. God has allowed Satan to have dominion over our world and over the thinking of our world. and over. That's why we see so much chaos and so much hatred and so much violence and all this other stuff that's going on in our world is not because God is breathing into it the things that are happening. He wants us to be at peace with each other. He wants us to act in love. He wants us to respond out of, out of, out of, of respect for one another. But that is not the world's way. That's not what Satan wants. And Paul is saying, listen, don't conform to that pattern. But be renewed in your mind. And that renewal is not a one-time thing. That renewal is not talking about once a week on a Sunday morning. That renewal is an ongoing renewing that is happening in your life every moment of every day until God calls you home. And then you don't got to be renewed no more. How awesome is that? Anybody excited about getting to go home, see Jesus, and not have to worry about sin anymore or the effects of sin on our life anymore? Can you imagine how incredibly cool is that going to be? But until that day, I don't know about you, but I know in my life I need to be renewed moment by moment by moment. Why? Because Satan is so good at easily getting me distracted. Satan is so good at, at, at wiggling his way into my thinking and into my actions and into my reactions. And, uh, and I, I'm not going to talk about my car. I, I talk to you guys about that all the time. Um, but he gets, in, he gets in there and he messes me up royally every minute. And i got to be renewed by God. And how does that happen? That happens, notice what it says in verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. What's he talking about? Keep the mercies of God at the forefront of your mind. What, what mercies of God, what, what has God done in our lives that, that we would be able to focus on? Well, if you go back through the book of Romans, you can see all these different things. Here's just a few. N number one, he justifies us. What does that mean? It's just as if you've never sinned. You get justified by God Dead to sin, alive in Christ. Uh, here's, here's a really awesome mercy of God. We're adopted in God's family as his sons and daughters. How awesome is that? Think about how incredible that is. Another mercy of God. We're under the power of grace, not law. We are possessors of the indwelling Holy Spirit. God in his mercy gives us peace and reconciliation with God. God in his mercy does not show any condemnation toward us. The Bible says very clearly in Romans, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. How awesome is that? 
The mercy of God shows us a promise of a future glory. The mercy of God tells us that there's no separation from God. The mercy of God gives us confidence in his faithfulness based on his faithfulness toward his people Israel. In view of God's mercies, do what? Notice what it says, by the mercies of God, present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Present your body. What's the idea there? The idea there is your body is your life. Everything about your life. In church, in this church service, they were passing offering plates. And this little girl got an offering plate, and she grabbed it. She took it out to the aisle, and she put it on the ground, and she stood in it. And the usher came up, can you imagine seeing that? The usher comes up, and he says to her, what are you doing? And she said, today in my life group, I learned, the teacher taught me that if I love Jesus, I need to offer him my life. So I'm putting my life in the offering plate today. Wow. Wow. Offer your life as a living sacrifice. You're alive. Every moment that you have, every breath that you take, you're alive. That's a mercy of God. He's allowed you to breathe one more breath. Why? So that you can live for him. So that you can present your body to him. So that you can give your life as a holy and acceptable offering to God. And notice what he says. This is a spiritual act of worship. Some passage, some of your versions might say reasonable service. Us offering our lives to God is an act of spiritual worship. What is spiritual worship? Spiritual worship is not just singing songs on a Sunday morning. Spiritual worship is all of life. All of life is worship to God. Every single thing you do, every single place you go, every single person you interact with, everything about your life can be a spiritual act of worship to God. You can know and you can do the will of God. Just a little bit, we're going to take communion to remember what Christ has done for us. Why we do that? Because Jesus directed us to do it. But not only did Jesus direct us to do it, but it's also just a really great practice for us to remember what Christ has done for us so that we can offer our bodies, so we can offer our lives as a living sacrifice so that we don't have to conform to the pattern of this world any longer, but we can be transformed by the renewing of our mind so that we can know and do the will of God. Do you want to know and do the will of God? Friend, then you've got to be willing to surrender your life as a living sacrifice to God. And say, you know what, I'm done with the pattern of this world. I don't want to think like the world. I don't want to act like the world. I don't want to react like the world. I want to be renewed moment by moment, day by day, by an awesome God whose mercies he's shown me and continues to show me every single day. Would you guys close your eyes and bow your head? Your eyes are closed, your heads are bowed. If you, if you don't have a communion cup and you'd like one, just raise your hand and the uh, deacons will come around and give you one of those. We're going to dive right into communion as, as a response. Yes, we're going to sing a song, but we're going to dive right into communion as a response because what a great thing to remember the mercies of God. And one of the greatest mercies that he has shown us is himself. He gave his life so that we can have life. So right now in this moment, with your eyes closed, your heads bowed, can I ask you a question? Is there anything that's standing in the way of you presenting yourself to God in a holy and acceptable way? So that as you remember and as you take communion, you do it in a way that honors and glorifies Jesus. Is there something standing in the way? Is there some sin issue going on in your life that you've not, you've not told God about? You've not admitted to God, not confessed to God. Maybe you're here today and, and you don't know Jesus. You don't have a relationship with Jesus. Can I, can I say to you, that's standing in the way. 
And it doesn't have to. Right here, right now, you can put your faith and trust in Christ. And you can know that, you know what, I'm going to take communion and I'm going to do it for the glory of God because right now I just put my faith and trust in Christ and I have a relationship with him. Maybe you're here today and you're going, I don't know how to do that. How, how, do I, how do I start a relationship with Jesus? I say this all the time, but it's as easy as A, B, C. A, acknowledge that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. B, believe that Jesus is that Savior that died and rose again to give you life and paid the penalty for your sin. And then C, confess that. What's that mean? That means to agree with or tell God. So right where you're at, you can pray and tell God, I need you. I'm a sinner, and I need a Savior, and I believe Jesus is that Savior, and I'm telling you, God, right now, that's me. Friend, if you know Jesus, is there some, some unconfessed sin in your life? Nobody knows except you and God. Maybe you need to right now say, you know what? Like that little girl, I'm going to put it all in the offering plate. I'm going to put it all in the offering plate. Maybe there's something that you're holding back from God. Maybe an area of your life. Maybe a loved one. Maybe a a job. Maybe, I don't know what it might be. But you're holding back and going, I want control. God's saying, let go. Jesus gave his life. He gave his life so that you can have life, friend.